Many thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. Before I jump right into this week's video, I do want to share something with you that arrived in the mail the other day because without you all, none of this would have been possible for me. And it's my silver play button plaque. It arrived in the mail just a, maybe, I guess two or three days ago. And it felt only fitting that I share it with you all on the channel today because like I just mentioned, without you all subscribing to my channel, I would not be holding this right now. And this really means a lot to me. So thank you for that. Now, as far as this week's video goes, Perhaps two of the most difficult aspects of composition, related to landscape photography, of course, have to do with both creating balance within your image and finding foreground elements to use in your composition. And both of those, I guess, common struggles can easily be solved with the magical power that is reflections. Reflections are they're great for, for creating balance, creating symmetry, developing an overall more harmonious photograph. I guess you could say that reflections are sort of like compositional rules, worst nightmare. And I'll dive into that a little bit more in just a minute. But nine times out of 10, the actual reflection itself, it becomes the, the, the foreground interest or that foreground element you're looking for. So it's really a win-win. Now, most like everything in uh, photography, there's multiple different ways that you can improve your photographic techniques and utilizing reflections is no different. And that's really the purpose of this week's video, to discuss kind of five must-know tips to improve your uh, reflective landscape photos. Now, I rated all these tips in order of importance, of course, with the tip or advice number one being the, the best tip or the best advice that I received with regards to uh, photographing reflections uh, within outdoor photography. And I do have a bonus tip at the end of the video, so be sure to stick around for that one. So to jump right into it, the, the fifth piece of advice or fifth tip that I have is to shoot vertical. Now, this doesn't mean that you always have to shoot vertical, but whenever you do shoot in a, a portrait orientation or a vertical orientation, you're creating a, a lot of uh, or more north to south or more up to down real estate in your actual frame that you can capture. And whenever you're photographing re uh, reflections, that's really what you want. You want to be able to capture as much of that reflection as you want. And you also want to have the ability or opportunity to capture as much of the actual subject that is being reflected. And here's an example right here where shooting in a portrait orientation enabled me to, of course, capture all of the tree, but also capture a lot of this reflection here and all of the uh, the, this, the color in the sky that's being reflected in the lake as well. So shooting in a, a vertical or a portrait orientation is great to just capture everything in its totality. Here's another great example right here. Not the best image in the world, but I kind of like that the fact that uh, you really don't know, notice the subject at all. And it's just this thin little island right through here. And then you got the reflection of the, the clouds right here in the foreground. And then of course you got the clouds in the, uh, the background as well. But shooting in that vertical orientation just gave you that additional real estate to capture everything. Now it doesn't mean you always have to shoot in a vertical orientation, but I would definitely recommend that if you're in a landscape orientation to flip it vertical and just see if you can capture a little bit more of that reflection. And here's one more example right here where you're just able to capture more of the actual subject of it right here and at the same time capture this bit of reflection right here that just kind of draws the eye into the actual image. Now, the fourth tip here, and this is a kind of a controversial one, it has to do with filters. Should you use them? Should you not use them? What filter should you use? Which filter should you not use? And most of the, uh, I guess, uh, debate is really centered around a polarizer. Because one of the biggest benefits of using a circular polarizer is that it, it removes shine off of objects. It removes um, sheen or glare, and it also removes reflections off of surfaces. So if you want to photograph reflections, why in the world would you ever want to put a filter on the end of your lens to remove those reflections? And that's a very valid point. But what I have found is that one of the beauties of using a circular polarizer is you can determine how much polarization you want to actually apply to that specific scene. So if you want to apply no polarization, you can rotate your polarizer to that point to where there's no polarization being applied. And then you can gradually increase the amount of polarization just depending on your specific scene. And what's cool about using a polarizer to shoot reflections is that you can set it to where, if you're careful, 
to where you can actually still get a lot of that reflection, but you can also see beneath the water. And this is amazing when there's interesting rocks or, or just subjects underneath the water to kind of bring some of that through if you don't want that perfect kind of mirror re replica of a, of a reflection and you want to be able to see a little bit beneath the surface, a polarizer is a great way to do that. And here's a good example right here where I just rotated the polarizer just a little bit to where I was still able to get a lot of the reflection of the clouds right through here and still see a lot of the, the rocks and the sticks and the things grow, not growing, but underneath the actual surface of the water. So utilizing a polarizer is great for that, to see beneath the surface a little bit and to still get a little bit of that reflection as well. Here's a, another example right here to where uh, I use a, a little bit more polarization in this scenario where it picked up a little bit less of the reflection, but I was, at the same time, I was able to see even more underneath the actual surface of the water as well. So being a little bit careful when you're using a polarizer is great. And I do think that a polarizer is definitely something you should test out. Now, the other filter that um, is fairly common when it comes to shooting reflections is a neutral density filter because sometimes the water isn't that perfect glass flat finish. And sometimes there's little ripples in it. it might be maybe it's a little bit windier day and using a neutral density filter to slow down that shutter speed whether it's a three stop a six stop or maybe a 10 stop nd filter can show down, slow down your shutter speed just a little bit to kind of smooth out those reflections you got an example right here and what's really cool is you can get these very kind of abstract painterly looking uh, reflections in the water if i zoom in here i mean this looks like a, a an actual painting right through here and it just, you know, you can see all the autumn colors right here. You can see all the tree trunks coming down. And I was able to achieve that look by throwing on, I think this was a, a six stop a neutral density filter and just slowing down that shutter speed to a few seconds to kind of smooth out the surface of the water and kind of get those abstract looking reflections as well. Here's another good example right here where the, uh, the surface of the lake wasn't smooth at all. You really can't see any of the reflection whatsoever put on an ND filter and slow down the shutter speed just a little bit, enabled those reflections to kind of come through just a little bit. And then I was able to slow down the shutter speed even more and kind of get that type of a reflection where the reflection is much smoother. And I also had a polarizer in as well here. You can actually see beneath the water a little bit better in this scenario, but you can really see how the reflection in this scenario kind of looks like a painting. So utilizing filters, I think, is great for, uh, for shooting reflections in outdoor photography, whether it's a polarizer, you just want to be careful with how much polarizer you're applying, polarization you're applying, and of course, an ND filter is a lot of fun to play with as well. Now, the third tip has to do with timing is everything. Now, you don't always have to, as we just mentioned, the, the surface of the water doesn't always have to be perfectly still, but ideally shooting in the morning or the evening those are generally the, the most still times of the day you really want to have wind below three to five miles per hour i mean you can do it around three or five miles per hour but definitely below that is ideal i usually use weatherbub to determine how much uh, the predicted amount of wind in a specific day i never actually measured how accurate it really is i never brought a windometer i know that's not what it's called but whatever those are called uh, on location to see exactly how accurate it is. But weather bug is pretty good for determining whether it's going to be really windy or it's going to be really still. But finding those times of the day where the wind is very low is great because, well, one, you want the surface of the water to be to still, but also in the morning and the evening, those are the times where the sun is lower on the horizon. And you're not going to get those kind of areas of uh, bright highlights glistening and glaring all off the water that's really hard to control. So shooting in the morning, shooting in the evening, and shooting on very calm days is a good best practice to get into. It's definitely not a necessity, but it's something that uh, definitely will help kind of give you those mirror-like reflections or give, give you a better opportunity to create uh, amazing looking reflections in your photographs. Now, the second tip has to do with getting low and getting close to your subject. And I talk about getting low a lot from a compositional perspective, and I think that's fantastic advice in many, many situations, but especially when it comes to shooting reflections, getting low to that reflection and getting close to it as well. And experimenting, you know, getting your camera in different angles and moving it up and down and left and right and shifting in different directions. It's amazing what you can do to the actual reflection once you get really close to it by angling it down and just kind of shifting subtle different angles or degree of angles that you are facing the actual reflection with your camera. And here's a good example right here where I was literally in this grass right here and shooting the reflection of uh, Yosemite Falls in the background here. 
And what's so cool about reflections, one of my favorite things is that that momentary bit of confusion that reflections cause. And I love these types of photographs where you don't have the actual subject in the frame. All you have is the reflection. And when you first look at it, you're not even 100% sure what you're looking at. So that momentary bit of confusion that reflections cause, I think is really cool. But this is just a good example of just getting really low to the actual reflection and uh, getting close to it. it really kind of just brings that out and just makes it a little bit more impactful of a photograph. Here's another example. I've shown this one before on this channel where the only way to actually get the uh, this monument in this puddle here was to get extremely low to it and get very close to this puddle in order to get these reflections to really come through. And then here's one more example where I got really low to these reeds in the water, got very close to them. And a lot of these, these reflections up here are very obvious, but getting closer and you can see these subtle reflections in the water of the reeds right through here. And it just makes them look a lot bigger than they really were just by getting very low to them and getting up close. So getting low and close is fantastic advice in really a lot of different uh, compositional situations, but especially when it comes to shooting reflections. Oh, here's actually one more example right here. We're just getting almost all the way down to the ground was able to capture and made this kind of pond area here look substantially larger and I was able to capture much more of this actual reflection right through here. So uh, that's just a, a great best practice to get into. Now the number one tip or the best piece of advice that uh, I've ever received with regards to shooting reflections has to do with breaking the compositional rules. Just throw them out the window because anyone who's been doing landscape or outdoor photography for a couple of years or maybe a year or maybe just a few months really you get really conditioned about the rule of thirds and, and never placing anything in the center of your frame and always putting your horizon on the bottom third or the top third but never in the in the in the center of the frame but when it comes to reflections and this is what i was saying in the beginning where i think reflections are compositional rules worst nightmare because shooting reflections it kind of just throws all of that out the window because when you're photographing reflections, you want to capture the reflection. So you don't want to put the horizon in the, uh, the bottom third or the top third. You want to make sure you can capture all of that reflection. You don't want to cut it off. And you also want to be able to capture all of the main subject as well. So a lot of times putting your horizon smack dab in the center of your frame is the best way to go. And I think this is a great example right here, because if I would have put the horizon here on the bottom third down here, I would have cut off the reflection. Or if I would have put the horizon on the top third, I would have cut off the trees. But putting it right in the center of the frame, which I know we're not supposed to do, but by putting it in the center of the frame, it created that perfectly balanced, symmetrical, and just an overall very harmonious looking image. And here's another example. I know I've shown this image a couple times on this channel before, but by putting that horizon right in the center of the frame, I was able to keep all of the reflection. I was also able to keep all of the, uh, the actual background intact as well and center everything up just creates that very symmetrical and very balanced image. And I think that's just fantastic advice when it comes to shooting reflections, because when I first started doing it, I was still trying to apply the rule of thirds. And a lot of times it just doesn't work. So when you go out shooting reflections, think about placing that horizon straight or dead center of your photograph and think about centering up your uh, the main subject right in the center of that image and just kind of pay attention to creating a balanced image, creating that symmetrical image and just that overall harmonious photograph. Now, the bonus tip is something that uh, I think is, a, is an interesting one. It has to do with how to focus when you're shooting reflections. And a lot of times focusing right on the reflection itself is a best is the way to get the best image. Now, a lot of this has to do with depending on, you know, how close is your reflection to your camera? How far away is the background? What aperture are you using? But what I would recommend is using an aperture between maybe F11 and F16 and taking a photograph where you focus on the background and taking another photograph where you focus on the actual reflection itself. That way, when you get home, you can pick out whichever one is best. And if you want to combine the two with uh, by using focus stacking, you can definitely do that as well. But what I have found is that a lot of times the best image comes from when you focus directly on that reflection itself to get that perfect just mirror razor sharp looking uh, reflection. So that's the bonus tip. I hope that one is, is, is uh, helpful as well. Now, before I do wrap up this week's video, I do want to say a big thanks again to the sponsor of this week's video, which is Squarespace, who I use for literally all of my website needs. Squarespace provides a dynamic and attractive online platform to create your website. You can display your photography using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs and customize the layout and look and feel of your gallery in order to make it your own. 
With Squarespace's traffic overview feature, you can track trends and page visits and views to better optimize your content. You can even grow and engage with your customers with Squarespace's email campaign tools, which enables you to create engaging emails that match your website with your products, blog posts, and logos, just so your messaging remains consistent. So if you are looking to start a new website or possibly upgrade your current website, check out squarespace.com forward slash Mark Denny for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. So I do hope you uh, enjoyed this week's video. Hope you're able to pick up some uh, helpful tips and best practices that you can apply to uh, the next time you go out uh, in search of uh, reflective landscape photos. If you did enjoy this week's video, if you could give it that thumbs up and subscribe to the channel, it definitely uh, helps out the channel and is greatly appreciated by myself. And as always, I appreciate you watching this week's video, and I will see you all next Wednesday.